Uh, today is the next to last message in the series, Stones and the Stories They Tell. Um, man, I have, I have loved digging into the testimony of, of nature, even through this passage. Next week we'll end with Easter, um, with a message called Reunited, and the, probably the story that, uh, the biggest story told by a stone would be the tomb, uh, the tombstone rolling away. So I look forward to Easter. I look forward to spending that day with you. The weight of this day in history and the weight of this passage is pretty intense. There, there's a gravity to it, and yet we get insight from history. Those present in the moment didn't have such insight. And so it gets lost on them. What it doesn't get lost on are the stones that surround, kind of witness the event. Let's pick up the event in Luke chapter 9, verses 29 through 44. As he approached Jesus, it's Jesus, so as Jesus approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of, his, two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it, bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road, and when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. He said, even you, even you had only known on this day what would bring peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. These days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They would dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. The event was lost on those that were there. It was not lost on creation surrounding them. It's not the first time that rocks or creation is mentioned in the testimony of who God is. Psalm 19, 1 through 4 says this, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voices goes, goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the earth. They, creation talks the talk. And then Paul says this in Romans 1. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, which he lists, his internal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people with, are without excuse. Creation talks the talk. Creation walks the walk. It's, it's not uncommon to have creation be willing to testify. Jesus wasn't exaggerating when he said this. He wasn't just using it for poetic effect. He understood that if no one else was going to recognize the significance of who he was and what he was doing, creation would respond. This wasn't the first Passover that Jesus was heading into in his 33 years. He had done this many times before. Passover was a Jewish feast where every Jewish male was required to go to the city to celebrate. It was, it was a celebration, it was a memorial of the uh, deliverance of Israel from Egypt. So it looked back deep into extra time, ancient time. And yet it just wasn't something to remember. It always had a sense of hope attached to it. It was a looking back in order to be informed of the power and the glory of God for freedom in the future. That was significant because Israel was an occupied territory. Rome had occupied it for some time now. America has never understood what it was like to be an occupied territory. 
America and our history are liberators. We, we liberate other people from being occupied. An occupying force takes all the best that there is for themselves. They, they kind of let try to let society go on in, in, in that country as, as it can, but yet all the buildings of, of importance are commandeered. Uh, the best of the resources go to them first. And there's a significant nature to having an occupying force. When I thought about this, this is what I, this is what I came up with. An occupying force tries to erase a, people, uh, a people's past. Or in other words, it erases their identity. An occupying force co-ops their present and it steals their future. And, and that's, 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 that's what Satan does. That's what sin does as an occupying force. It tries to rob us of our identity, who we are, co-ops our present, uses it for that game, and then tries to just steal and to obliterate our future. Israel was an occupied force. Rome was the occupier. They longed, they longed for a king. And when Jesus enters and he enters as a king and he doesn't enter as a king, he, he, he enters as a king to the praise of a king as if he was just coming back from a war where he would have won, and yet Jesus is going to a war, not coming from one. And then there's kind of a mixed messages here because he doesn't come in on a royal steed. And I'm sorry, but when I was writing this this week, I just thought of Shrek. You have to go to the old time Disney reference there, folks. You got to have someone in their twenties, I guess, to, to to have watched that growing up. And but he comes in, he comes in on this donkey, this most humble, most humble of creatures. You see how all these metal, everything's getting mixed up. He's he's coming in the shouts of a king, but yet he's not coming as a king that you would expect coming as a king. He he comes in this in this humility. The weight of it was lost on them. Jesus was a different king. And I think this entrance, this day in history, gives us maybe one of the fullest pictures outside of the cross of his love for us. Jesus gives instructions to go get this colt. And, and Israel would not have been, um, having something commandeered by someone would not have been something different for them. So Jesus, when he sends him in for the colt, then he says, okay, look, but if you experience someone asking you why you need it, you tell them, you tell them that I need it. The Lord needs it. And it's interesting because even the language, so I'm a Bible nerd. I tell you I'm a Bible nerd. And so, so when, when you look even deeper into the, in how the words are used in this passage, when the owners of the coal ask, the word for owner, the Greek word for owner there is on, is on the screen, karioi. But then when he says, he says, well, then tell them the Lord has asked of it, then this word is used, kurios. You see, even in the language, even had it been written, there would have been, there would have been this, this idea of how to try to put this idea of ownership and kingship together. One, it's saying, yeah, you're the little owner. I'm the supreme owner. Even in the language, Jesus is conveying that he's a king. But you know what? Kings aren't known for their love. Kings are known for their exploits. They're, they're known for their victories. They're, they're known for the number of subjects. They're known for how much they've accumulated. But kings, you read about them. You don't read a lot about kings saying, man, they were, that was a loving king. That guy right there, that king, he was the best king we had. He loved the best. You don't hear that when you read about kings. But yet this passage tells us all about how Jesus loves. And in fact, the way I phrased it is that Jesus loves like that. There's at least three different ways in which Jesus, it demonstrates his love. The first is the idea that he enters the city on his own. He enters the city on his own. What do I mean by that? Well, there was no coercion necessary. However, coercion was tried many times before. When Jesus would heal someone, um, when he performed a miracle, the people wanted to rise up and they wanted him to go in and be king. And yet he would always slip out from amongst them because that wasn't his time and that wasn't his purpose the way they saw that. And then, gosh, just a week or two before the plots of trying to kill Jesus started increasing in intensity because there was an expectation that maybe he was a king and they were going to kill him. And he knew when he enters the city, he knew what was coming. This is how Jesus loves. You know, obedience, my mom used to tell me that obedience um, wasn't... Uh, if it wasn't done immediately and with a smile on my face, it wasn't obedience. 
And all the moms and dads shake, shaking their head, right? She said, well, you're, not, you know, you're just doing it. You're compelled to do it, but, but there isn't anything among you that you're not honoring me when you do this. Jesus wasn't coerced into the city. He wasn't tricked into the city. He enters the city on his own. In fact, Philippians 2, 6 through 8, Paul says this. Who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. I mean, think about that. Yeah, all, do, you, do you know people that have a lot of power? How is that power generally used? To their own advantage. How do kings use the power? To their own advantage. And yet it says, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearances of a man. He humbled himself and became becoming obedient to the death, to death, even death on a cross. My point is, he didn't have to be coerced to the cross. Jesus goes willingly because he loves like that. The second is that he loved enough to be patient with their imperfect understanding. So verse 37 of that passage says, When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all of the what? The, the miracles they had seen. They were basing their praise in what they had seen, not in what they knew. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And at no time does Jesus stop to correct them. He didn't say, no, 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 you, know, you, you, don't have, you haven't got it all right. You, have, you need to get this in line. You need to get this in line. You're a little wrong here. You're wrong there. No, he doesn't, he doesn't do any of that. Jesus knew that the crowds didn't have this 100% figured out. But he loved them for what they did understand. So as I'm writing the message, I, I, I thought to myself, what's my understanding of God like? So the question I pose to you, how's your understanding of God? I mean, that's, sometimes that's a question you want to run from. And yet, what the, what the passage is showing is that he was patient with their level of understanding. Jesus loves like that. It wasn't about getting it all right. What do you know? They were worshiping at their level of understanding. Now, when you get asked, well, what's your understanding of God like? It's, it feels like a test question. But when we turn to God, we don't, we don't get it. It's not like we're turning in a test paper of, un, of our understanding and we get it back like it's stained with red marks of correction. You remember those days when you got those things? Like when the professor put the thing face down on your desk? Okay, so only I had a 2.4 in college. But when we turn our lives into God, we get them back washed clean by his blood. No red ink. Red blood. He loves like that. Now, does he want our understanding to grow? Of course he wants our understanding to grow. When I finished grad school and I moved back home and then got a job and, and then moved away, my parents, really only child, depended on me a lot for our family business. And it, 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 was, it was really, it was, a, it, was a, it was a struggle for me emotionally leaving them. And I remember saying to my mom and dad, listen, I, now this is the dad who said when I turned 18 and left for college, he said, you're just getting old enough to be useful. Okay. And then now, then seven years later, and I leave and I'm feeling guilty for leaving. And they said, we didn't raise you to stay. We raised you to leave. Now, this is a little bit where the analogy breaks down. God didn't raise us to leave, but he did raise us to lead. He raises us and matures us so that we can have impact on others, that, that as we grow and develop, our understanding of God grows and develops. But he loves like this, that in whatever level of understanding we have, he doesn't come in and chastise that. He comes and he grows that. In fact, he, he, right, this is where he turns to the Pharisees and says, listen, pal, 
paraphrase. Listen, pal, you think this is an issue. You want me to calm this thing down because you don't want Rome to get upset. But if they, don't, if they don't worship me out of their understanding right now and the rocks start worshiping, I think you're going to have a bigger problem. Jesus loves like that. And then the last piece really is that he loved enough to be rejected. There are only two recorded times in Scripture that Jesus cries. One only happens just a little while earlier when his friend Lazarus, Lazarus dies. And he knows Lazarus is going to die. And he knows that he's going to stand at the entrance of Lazarus' tomb and say, hey, Lazarus, come out. And yet when he comes in contact with Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, he cries. Shortest verse of Scripture all in the Bible. It's, it's, it's probably more like a tweet. Okay. John eleven thirty five, nine 35, nine characters, two words, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. When, when Scripture was recorded, it wasn't recorded chapter and verse. Other editors came in to try to make it easier for us to put it together and read. So I want you to think about this. Whoever, whoever was assigned this passage... And they're reading the story in the account of Lazarus. And they come to the place where Jesus is so moved with compassion that he cries. This person had to say, okay, it needs its own verse. I can't just put this in this whole story like that. There needs to be, there needs to be a period of the, the sentence before it. And there needs to be a period after this. Because Jesus was attached to the, even to the emotions of those two sisters. Jesus wept. And then a week later, he enters the city of Jerusalem. The people that he came for, the people he came from, and it says, he wept. How I longed, how I longed for you to understand. But he knew they didn't understand. And he goes anyway. That's how Jesus loves. There was going to be rejection. He went anyway. Less than two weeks, Gene and I would be married 28 years. And I remember the first time I said, I love you. Do you remember the first time and who went first? If you've been married, if you're married, who was the first to say, I love you? Do you remember those butterflies? Or bats or freaking falcons? You know, I mean, you know, you're just. You're just scared to death, right? It's like we're all middle school students and we got the little paper that says, do you like me? Check yes, check no. And, you know, you're sliding it through a friend. There, what, what is the level of risk when you are the first to say I love you? There's high risk. You're stepping out and you're not contemplating, well, well, what if they say, well, you're thinking, what if they say no? But it doesn't influence you to the place where it doesn't tell you to say, I love you. Jesus loves like that. He's the first to say, I love you. And it's not predicated on your response. It's all self-contained in him. Yes, everybody missed this. But then four days later, four days later, Jesus gathers with his 12 to celebrate this Passover. But in doing so, he turns the whole thing on its ear. And it's no longer just a memorial of something that took place in the past. He turns the whole supper around to reflect on who he is. And then he uses, come on, Harry, then he uses another word picture that will unmistakably imprint this event and unmistakably imprint that how he loves when he walks them through celebrating this Passover. Pastor Harry is going to take us through this part. The last time Charlie and I did this was about 10 years ago. 
and I'm uh, blessed to be able to do it this morning. Passover. Four days after Jesus entered Jerusalem, he and his disciples gathered to celebrate Passover. Charlie has described what it was. It celebrated a very ancient event in Israel's history. It was one of seven feasts that God commanded his people Israel to celebrate every year. In fact, it was the first one on the calendar. And so they gathered for this important feast, and, and as Charlie said, the, the men were all required to come to Jerusalem to celebrate it. But this Passover observance was different than any other that the disciples had ever attended. This Passover feast foreshadowed a greater event that would forever change the way God's people would both relate and interact with him. When Jesus implemented what we now call communion or the Last Supper, he did so during this Passover Seder. Seder is just the word attached to the ceremony itself. For much of the evening, it would have looked like any other Passover that they'd taken part in. But during the meal, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks for it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after the supper, when Jesus came, there were four cups of wine as a part of the Seder ceremony. This was probably the third one, appropriately called the cup of redemption. And when he comes to it, he changes the Seder again. Luke describes it this way. After the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Those words that Jesus used were not in the Seder ceremony, but they were words that were associated with the Jew Jewish betrothal process. The words are rich in meaning, and the imagery expresses both Jesus' love for us in the most intimate of terms. So for the next few minutes, what I would like us to do is compare this Jewish betrothal process and what we experience in communion today. In the Jewish betrothal ritual, brides were usually chosen by the father of the bridegroom. He would often send his most trusted servant to find a bride. In fact, in Genesis, that's exactly what we see. Abraham sends his servant to find a bride for his son, Isaac. As we celebrate communion today, we acknowledge that we also are chosen. We are chosen by God. In John, Jesus says it this way, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Then the fathers of the potential bride and groom would meet, and they would discuss the marriage of their children. If they agreed to the marriage, they negotiated a price for the father of the groom to pay to the father of the bride. It was usually a very large price. It could have been as much as the cost of a home. It reflected the loss of a daughter to her family of origin, and it reflected the value of the bride coming to the groom. As the bride of Christ, we've also been purchased with a very high price, the blood of Jesus himself, his precious blood that was shed on the cross at Calvary's Hill was the price that God agreed to pay. For you and I. In the Jewish betrothal ritual, if the price was agreed, the groom's father would give a cup of wine to the groom for him to offer to his bride. As the groom gave the cup to the potential bride, he would say these words, this cup is a covenant in my blood which I offer to you. The husband was announcing that he was committing his life to her in the solemn setting of a blood covenant. The covenant commitment was binding. There was no escape clause in it. It was a lifetime commitment. 
As we participate in communion, the cup serves as the symbol of the covenant. It's the covenant through which Christ obtained us, his church, by the shedding of his blood to secure our place in the family of God. Covenants are always sealed with blood in the Bible to confirm the serious nature of the commitments that are being made. Paul affirms this in 1 Corinthians when he quotes Jesus saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus gave his blood to secure this covenant commitment to us just as the bridegroom was committing his life to his bride. In the Jewish betrothal process, if the potential bride took the cup and drank it, she was sealing the offer of the marriage covenant. In Jewish custom, marriage was not a contract that could be easily broken, but a covenant that was intended to be permanent. When we receive communion like the bride, we are affirming and we are acknowledging our covenant relationship with Jesus. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, until he returns. His death was for us to seal the new covenant for everyone, for each one who would place their trust in him alone. In the Jewish betrothal ritual, once the covenant of marriage was concluded, the bridegroom would leave and go back to his father's house and begin to prepare a place for his bride. The bridegroom often added rooms to his father's house as the place for his bride. At that point, the marriage was finalized, but it was not consummated. In preparing his disciples for what was to come, Jesus says it this way, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Wow, here's the promise, that where I am, there you may be also. He's gone to prepare a place for us, his bride, in his father's house, and he's promised, as the bridegroom did, to return so that we might be with him forever. Say that word, forever. In the Jewish betrothal custom, as much as a year later, depending on how long it took the, bride, uh, the bridegroom to prepare the, the dwelling, he would then return but no one knew exactly when that would be. So the bride had to remain ready for the groom's return. The Jewish bridegrooms usually came for their brides late at night, near the midnight hour. A crier would announce his coming, and the sound of the shofar, the ram's horn, would announce his return, and then everyone in the village would turn out, and there would be a great celebration, dancing in the streets. And so it will be for the bride of Christ. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Our, our Jewish believing friends would say the shofar of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will always be with the Lord. And he ends, therefore, comfort one another with these words. We don't know when he's returning. In fact, no one knows the exact time of his return. So like the Jewish bride, the church is to remain ready. In the Jewish betrothal process, the groom would then take his bride to his father's house, and there they would consummate the marriage, and there followed a great wedding feast. Seven days. Can you imagine that? Seven days of partying after the wedding. So Jesus promised that when he returns, he will take us to his house, that he is prepared for us. 
There the marriage of the Lamb and his bride, the church, will be completed, completing the wedding feast of the Lamb. John gives us history in advance in Revelation when he says this, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Many think this will occur during the Great Tribulation here on earth, I concur. His disciples would have recognized the betrothal and marriage language that Jesus was using that night. Jesus was looking ahead and clearly announcing to them that something new and different was about to take place. Jesus was offering himself to them in a far deeper relationship than had previously existed. He placed this offer in the context of a blood covenant. His blood offered to seal this new relationship, the long-promised, long-awaited new covenant in the language of the Jewish betrothal ceremony. This was the most powerful and passionate way that the Lord could have declared his love for his disciples and his love for each one of us today who would receive him as Savior and Lord. Erica, if you'll come up. So this morning, what I want us to do as we prepare to receive communion is first remember what he has done for us. First, he chose you. Long before you ever received him, before the foundation of the earth, he chose you as his own. The price he paid for you was very high. It's the highest price that the father could have paid. It was the blood of his own son, his much beloved son. Third, he's gone to prepare a place for you in his father's house. He loves you that much. Fourth, he's coming back for you. And his coming is imminent. In our theology, imminence means near. His coming is near. And you're to remain ready. Be ready for his coming. It's imminent. Fifth, his return for you will be preceded by a loud cry and the trumpet of God the shofar of God. And last, he will take you to be with him forever. Dear ones, communion is much more than a ritual practiced in the Christian community for the last two millennia. It's a remembering. It's a reaffirming the covenant commitment that Jesus made to us on our behalf and sealed it with the shedding of his own blood. Communing with him is a sacred act designed by God to acknowledge Jesus' great love for us and our love and gratitude return to him for bringing us into the family of God. When we truly commune with Jesus, listen carefully. When you truly commune with Jesus, you will bless God. You will bless one another. You will bless your children and your grandchildren. You'll bless the church we will be witnesses of the great love of God to those who have not yet come to know him. And oh yes, in that process, you will also be blessed. Today, we're gonna celebrate communion. We're gonna use an ancient method, it's called intincture. 
You're going to come after we've prayed. You're going to come and you're going to take a piece of the bread and you're going to dip it in the juice and you're going to receive the body and the blood of Christ. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus went to the Passover celebration, but he changed everything. During the meal, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said to his followers, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. In like manner, after the supper, he took that third cup, the cup of redemption, and he said to his followers, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. The remembrance of those things that I laid out before you. He chose you. He called you to him. He laid down his life for you, shed his blood, the highest price that could have been paid. He's gone back to make a place for you, and he's coming again to take you to be with him forever. I'm gonna pray for us, but before you come, let me encourage you to pray as well. This is your time to commune with the Lord, to be one with Him. This is a sacred time for us. It's not just an act that we do. This is a time of communing with the one who loves us more than life itself. Let's pray. Father, we've come as the body of Christ this morning. We've heard your word. We come now to celebrate the sacred event that you have declared for us to do. We come to commune with the Lord Jesus. We know what he's done for us, something we could have never done for ourselves. And so we come with great gratitude. We come humbly. We bless you. We thank you that you were willing to send your son to do what only he could do. So I pray blessings on this congregation, Father, as we commune now with you, not simply taking of the elements, but coming in a deep and personal way. Amen. Elders, if you'll come and There'll be four stations, two here, two in the back. Seek him. Commune with him this morning. And when you're ready, you come and receive.
and Jesus' love like that. Or how personal. This is my body. This is my blood. Their heads must have been spinning. This was all so brand new to them. And yet they knew. They they knew something was going to change. Something was going to be different. On Friday, they thought it was over. And on Sunday, it all began again. And then 50 days later, when the Holy Spirit came at another Jewish feast, and Peter stands up in the midst of probably some of the very same people that would have stood up to yell, crucify him. Peter stands up and says, that was the Christ. Scripture says they were cut to the heart. They said, what shall we do? They said, repent and be saved. And over 3,000 people had the understanding that Jesus loves like that. Their understanding, limited it probably is an overstatement. No one dragged him to the cross. In fact, he tells Pilate, you have no authority over me. I give my life. And he knew he'd be rejected. He came anyway. He loves like that. I don't know where you are on your spiritual journey. But the fact that you're in this room or you're watching online is proof that you are on a spiritual journey. Wherever you are in this process, he loves you like that. It's overwhelming, actually. In my father's house, there are, there's plenty of room. Father, we're so grateful thousands of years later to be able to celebrate this day with some of the some of the gravity more of the gravity of the event Lord I pray for the men and women and students in this room now Lord that that they know in this moment something is different this is this can't be manufactured the emotion the or thinking how their heart and stomach even feels in this moment is something that cannot be manipulated. It's your spirit communicating your longing for a relationship deeper than what it is right now. Lord, I pray for those who feel like they are at an arm's length and distant from you. And that this moment in time would be a turning point in that journey of theirs. Because there is no way to explain the power and the presence of your spirit other than receive it for what it is. So Lord, I pray in this moment that they would surrender their life to you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. You know, you don't, you don't get all of this figured out before you believe. It comes in waves. It begins with this overwhelming sense of of need on our part of, of brokenness and wanting to be whole. 
and believing that Christ is the answer for that wholeness. And it's amazing then how, how our understanding grows, how, how he pulls us close to himself and how there may be things in your life, in your past, you've been waiting for answers for and, and there may never be answers for them in this life. But God's love for you is not predicated on your understanding. It's predicated on your movement. And then there are more things that you'll gain access to and insight to as you grow and you get older, more mature in the faith. But if you're waiting for all the answers, you're going to be waiting for a long time. But you don't have to wait to respond to the love of God. Wow, I love you first is a powerful statement. I love you first. He loves you first. If you're a guest with us today, it's been great having you a part of our worship service on Palm Sunday. And uh, we know it's never easy walking into a new place. And we're grateful that you took a chance on us today. Right after the benediction, we'd love to get a chance to meet you. Pastor Chris and others will be out under that big sea out there. And and, uh, we have a gift for you, thanking you for, for coming today. If you'll stand for the benediction. I can't wait to see you across the street hunting, hunting Easter eggs. I'm, I always try to get there first so I can scope me out some, hide them a little deeper in the, in the weeds so no one, I can get them afterwards. Um, so you need to come keep me honest and uh, hope to see you on Easter. Now for the benediction, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May make his face to shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. And you're rising up, and you're laying down, and you're going out and coming in both now and forevermore. God bless you. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon.